the Almost Perfect Podcast. Welcome to the Almost Perfect Podcast, a celebration of fuck-ups, failures, and falling flat on your face. This is a podcast that believes you can learn from experience, but that experience doesn't have to be your own. Ha, I'm the perfect, and I'm a functional fuck-up. Let's learn from somebody else's mistakes. And today we're learning from Sam Turpin. Now, Sam is a musician who mostly delves into the hip-hop music, but not hip-hop as you know it. Uh, the kind of hip-hop that you might hear on chilled, low-fi beats to, like, chill to, except there's lyrics as well, because Sam raps. And yeah, Sam creates some really interesting beats, some really interesting melodies, and some, as he puts it, uh, left-field kind of stuff. So I really enjoy his music. I do find him to be quite different to what a lot of other cats are doing out there. And, you know, I appreciate unique music. I appreciate unique people. And Sam's also a pretty unique dude. Um, Sam is someone who is very thoughtful and introspective and has a pretty, like, different worldview to a lot of people. So definitely someone who I wanted to chat to. When I was in Josie recently, I was just like, yeah, man, I've definitely... I just hit him up on Twitter. I was like, yo, dog, are you free for an interview tomorrow? And he was like, yeah, let's do it. And so we met up and we did this one. Uh, we did it outside and I didn't have my wind protector. So it's taken a bit of editing uh, to try and make it sound good. I think it sounds decent. I think it sounds listenable, definitely. Uh, better than listenable. Well, obviously listenable. Well, how can it be better than listenable? I am stumbling over my words here. But you get what I mean. Uh, the quality isn't the best, but it's not the worst either. And since this is the almost perfect podcast, that kind of makes sense. Yes, it's been a little while since uh, we've done one of these. My apologies. I have been bouncing around the country as well as just trying to get other work done at the moment. Um, yeah, just <laughs> unfortunately the podcast sometimes has to take a little bit of a backseat uh, when it comes to other things that pay me more money. And uh, I need to make that money, make that paper, because we live in a capitalistic society. And so, yeah, I've just unfortunately had to take a slight break over the last month from the podcast. But the cool thing is, it uh, looks like I'm going to be doing a lot more of them over the next month or so. I'm going to try to get a bunch of interviews done. And then I can just, you know, do these intros. And hopefully, hopefully the whole process will just get a little bit easier for me and then I can do these and I can do work and we can all be quite happy because doing these does make me really happy I really enjoy getting to chat to interesting creative people and you know share those conversations with you and then you tell me what you think about them which is pretty dope I like really appreciate the feedback thank you to everyone who actually we did a little competition recently uh, you could win a voucher to HQ Gaming for 250 Rand I'm going to be announcing that on the social media pretty soon uh, the person who won that but all you had to do was go and review the podcast on itunes and send me a screenshot or be a patron on patreon you could have done either of those two things and you would be entered into the draw so i'm going to do that probably a little bit later today or maybe tomorrow i'm going to get the draw done and then one of you is going to win a 250 rand voucher to hq gaming uh and that's because jacques henning who's the owner of hq gaming was one of the guests on this podcast he was I guess, like, a little while ago, about three or four weeks ago now. So, yeah, Jacques decided, yeah, man, I'll give you 250 bucks to give to one of your listeners, one of your lucky, lucky listeners. And so, yeah, one of my lucky, lucky listeners is going to be getting that 250 rand voucher probably tomorrow. Probably tomorrow. Um, I'll do the draw, I'll go through everything. And you know what? That means you guys have, like, one last chance. If you haven't entered yet, go on to iTunes, leave a review, uh, take a screenshot of that and send it to me at almostperfectpod at gmail.com. And yeah, you can be entered into that. You can also sign up to the Patreon. Um, yeah, it's the thing that I like. I got to do this. I got to tell you guys about it. I got to try to get some money out of you since I'm doing this whole thing for free. And I don't want to necessarily be doing it for free. Like it would be nice to uh, be doing this for a bit more money. And I really do appreciate the people who are chipping in money. We've got a bunch of people up in the Patreon over there, uh, which is really cool. You know, <laughs> like it's really dope that people are like, yeah, man, I like this thing enough to pay for it. So if you like this thing enough uh, to maybe give me a dollar, that's like, what, 15 Rand a month? That's cool. 
You can do that. You can do that. Go to patreon.com forward slash almost perfect. Uh, you will be entered into draws for various things. Uh, you'll get to know about guests ahead of time. You'll get to ask them questions. Uh, you'll also get to suggest guests and stuff. So there's a little bit of extra vibe over on the Patreon. And like basically, I will listen to you more over there. Like I'll still listen to you on the other platforms. You can hit me up on the social medias, you know, on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all of that. And you know what? I'll listen to you. But, like, if your suggestion sucks, then I'm just going to not listen to it at all. But if you pay me money, and your suggestion sucks, like, I might just humor you a little bit. You know, I might be like, yeah, dude, that's a pretty good idea. I'm totally going to do that. Whereas, if you don't pay me money, I'm not even going to give you that. I'm just going to be like, oh, cool. That's it. That's it. So, you're paying, you're paying for me to be nicer to you, essentially. Which is, once again, we live in a capitalistic society. And, uh, you know what, I'm a very, yeah, I'm gonna sell, no, I'm not fucking going down that path. You know what, we actually need to keep going along a different train. Um, yeah, I was in Joburg recently, I was at Comic-Con, I got hired to be the MC uh, for the Magic the Gathering side of things. There were like a bunch of different Magic the Gathering tournaments, and yeah, I got to play in them, and I got to MC, and I uh, also got to win! Yes, I actually won one of the tournaments, uh, the the standard tournaments, which is, if you know what that means, you know what that means, if you don't know what that means, you don't know what it means, so no point trying to explain it to you, but either way, pretty happy myself, you know, pretty happy, uh, good job, good job, Bob, I can pat myself on the back and feel, you know, validated that I'm fairly decent at a card game that I've been playing since I was a young teen, I would hope, I would hope to be pretty good at it by now. You know, I would hope, after all these years, that I might be fairly decent. And yeah, winning the standard tournament at Comic-Con definitely helped me feel like it wasn't all a waste, you know. I haven't wasted all these years. I actually, you know, had a point to it. I wanted a little bit of money. And uh, yeah, just a lot of pride. Got to beat some of the best players in the country. And if you, by the way, know what Magic the Gathering is, and you like playing Magic the Gathering... I've got another podcast with a guy called Karan Chetty. He's been like the South African captain for Magic. And I know some of you are like, dude, what the fuck are you talking about? Don't worry, we'll get to the podcast with Sam in a bit. But if you know what I'm talking about, uh, yeah, we've got a podcast called The Sharks MTG Podcast, which is on all platforms at the moment. So you can go check that out. Got to do that cross promotion. Got to do all these vibes. Um, is there anything else I need to chat to you about before we get into this podcast? I've mentioned the Patreon, I've mentioned Comic-Con, uh, what else has been happening in my life? Um, not much, actually. Other than that, oh yeah, you can't get a hold of me on social media, on my personal social medias at the moment. I'm taking a bit of a break, I've deactivated Facebook, and I'm not on th that Twitter account at the moment. I'm still doing stuff from the Almost Perfect account, though. So, the Almost Perfect podcast on Facebook... Uh, almost underscore podcast, no, almost underscore podcast, yeah, almost underscore podcast on Twitter, and I have got Instagram, but I'm busy trying to set up a cool vibe on there, so there's no content on there at the moment, but that's almost perfect pod, I think, almost perfect podcast, uh, I should probably know these things before I try and tell you about them, but also you know how to search for stuff, you're a child of the internet, uh, even if you're like in your 40s or 50s. I assume you know how to just Google the Almost Perfect Podcast Instagram. Or just go on Instagram and search for the Almost Perfect Podcast. It's crazy how the search function works these days. Crazy. Um, also, you know, if you do that, then it'll track you forever and try to sell you products based on... I don't know what. I don't know what the demographics for this are yet. Um, I should probably do that soon. Then I can approach advertisers and I can stop asking you guys for money on Patreon. I don't know. I don't know what the business model for this thing is. But I do know that you're going to enjoy this conversation that I had with Sam Turpin. So without further ado, here it comes. It's the Almost Perfect Podcast with Sam Turpin. How are you living? What's, your, what's up to these days, Sam? I'm working on a lot of new music, actually. Um, I've actually kind of noticed that you've been, I mean, my email's been popping off with stuff from you this year. Yes, yeah, so I dropped two new songs, um, which is just my solo stuff. But I'm also doing a new album with my group, which is called Cold Chinese Food. Okay. And then we're also, as called Chinese food, we're part of a wider collective, which is called. Oh, wait, so the thing's called, called Chinese food? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, cool. That's, it's me and um, our producer, Ella N. 
and but we're also a part of Charles Jean Suite, which is a much wider collective of they call themselves traveling ensemble. Is this like a international kind of up? There are people in it who are all over the place, but the the core of it, which is Ila and this guy Noah, that's here in Johannesburg. Okay, because I've also noticed that's one of the things that's been really cool about your career is you interact with people from like all over Africa, basically. And yes. then recently, um, I can't remember her name, but she's in London. Oh, India Shan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, so how does that come about, man? Like, for, for a cat from South Africa, you've released quite a lot of music with people from overseas. And it's not like you're this big artist that everyone knows and, you know, it's right. like... So how do these things happen? Um, I guess, okay, from my personal perspective, um, my parents were very global, right? So um, I never had a sort of limited worldview, uh, which is not necessarily to say that others do, but um, my father's British from the UK. And my mother, being of Jewish heritage, she had family everywhere. So I always knew that, you know, like, I don't know, the world is bigger than what's around me. And the internet just opened that up more, I guess, when it became really a thing, which is my generation was the first to, like, do you know what I mean? Have that as a platform. So you would say it's, you know, your parents being global citizens, as well as the world just changing and it being more accessible. Yeah, it's all of that combined in just my own situation, um, not being confined anywhere. So it's a great privilege as well. Yeah, yeah. what do you mean by not being confined? Like, um, I don't know. <laughs> just, we okay, so I have very few family in Johannesburg and a little bit more, but also few in South Africa generally. Everyone's sort of in Europe, America, all over the place. So as a child, even we'd go and visit. So I knew how different societies were, I knew how different worlds were, I knew how to talk to people different from me. Even in South Africa, my parents were in the struggle, so I knew how to talk to South Africans different from me. Yeah. So I never, when I say never was confined, I was never confined to any, like, one direction of how to be a person, or even just culturally, I was always open and exposed to open different things. Did that cause any problems for you, like in school and stuff? Like I can imagine maybe other people might see you as like a bit of a weirdo because you've got this cool world view um or were people ex are accepting of you because you were so open with them and so like yeah no so. no specific problems i can think of unless if being original or unique is a problem yeah. if you view that as well it can sometimes be difficult to be an individual yeah, you know, especially in like school and stuff so i definitely had that aspect of it yeah didn't have many friends in high school but, okay yeah. well that's that's essentially what i mean like where you like a little outcast because, oh yeah because your worldview I mean, because you know what school's like, man. Like, you don't get that open-mindedness. You don't yeah, get that, no, like... Swear. And just from my understanding of you as a person, you seem to have been this cat who's always had his own ideas and his own way of seeing the world. So I was just wondering, yeah, what school life must have been like for you? Um, well, so I had friends. I wasn't, like, a complete yeah, yeah, loner, obviously. but they weren't in my high school. So, because, okay. so how that happened was my brother and I, we went to a government school uh, for primary school. And that's where we really made most of our friends. And... Um, then we got to high school, we was on an art program uh, at a private school in like Sanson, which is up here, it's yep. the rich part of town. And we really didn't fit in at all. And we just hated every second of it. And our losing our mother halfway through made it even worse for that. So my mind was never, like I almost didn't finish high school. My mind was never there. It was always, and that's when I started making music. My mind was always somewhere else. And I guess having that background of knowing about the world, it was my safety net, I guess you could say. And like your parents being a part of the struggle, like, I mean, it's not, not many white kids can, you know, say that. Uh, how much did that affect things like for you growing up? Did you realize like that things were different for you, that your parents were different to like other white people? Like um, how much of that was a thing that you thought about growing up? Again, only, only when I got to high school, I started to notice it because even our neighborhood, like I was always like from around central Johannesburg, so always crazy mix. And I thought that was normal. Yeah. Right. So, and then I go to high school in Santon and then. It was also mixed, but it's like the... Yo, what's up, Anthony? How are you? Hey, 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 um, also, th those white people are like different. different. Yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. But it, that's, that's money white people. So I, I viewed that as the difference. I didn't necessarily think they... They were just, I thought it was just rich, and then that's how rich people are everywhere. Yeah. I kind of feel the same way, because I come from like a poorer community. And so, yeah, like, you know, it's very mixed race, very cool. Everyone's very chilled and stuff. But then as soon as, like, as I got older, I was interacting with, you know, richer white people. And just that classism <laughs> thing is just, the classism and racism overcrossed so much within that culture. And, yeah, same, similar situation for me. Like, high school was horrible for me in lots of different ways. Like, yeah. But, 
yeah like I've always kind of had just that weird thing but I mean I never you know had that upbringing of having parents who were actually conscious about it you know like like kind of the opposites not that like you know my mom was pro apartheid or anything but she wasn't like an activist she right. wasn't someone who yeah. was like anti-racism or anything just getting by and stuff yeah I feel that. um yeah I don't know what to say like to me it was just normal and but recently I've started to notice how blessed I am do you know what I mean especially having also gone to university and stuff like that and seeing again just more and more people I realized how unique and blessed my situation was and I, I thank for every day for that so well I actually wanted to bring up your mom a little bit later but we kind of already in that <laughs> let's do it man in that vibe I mean have you like you wrote a song about it pretty really, uh, recently it wasn't Sahara Flow no Summer was, Evening the one with Sahara India yeah, yeah 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 what took you so long to finally write a song about your mom man like um, and oh. also was the issue of writing a song about your mom the fact that she does have like reverence in this country because uh, people might not know but your mom's a photographer yeah. uh, who's did a lot of important work back in the day and even you know part post apartheid yeah. she was still very important in south african art yeah so was there a lot of pressure uh, and like was that like were you worried that if people know you've written a song about your mom that they're going to judge it in that way or? um no so i don't think my mom was ever that well known Really? Yeah, no, I think if it's like if you knew, you knew. And, you know, she had a I very... Mean, I guess the circles I know, like, know her they were, well. Okay, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, the star, art, the star art circles, but not, like, random people, like, within the art world. Yeah. Um, but the only pressure, um, which is actually a, a constant thing, it will never go away, is just that I know I have a mission to do. Okay. And that's the only pressure. So it's not really pressure. It's more like a reminder of, um, I, I got... So, you know, I have things to do in this world to, to try and make it better, because... That's what she was doing, and that's why I'm here. So, is this, but don't you? Doesn't that ever feel like swack? Don't you ever feel like, oh, I don't want to have this responsibility today? Like, can't I just like? No, because I think there's too few people who try to make a difference. So, if I can in any way bear that light, I want to do it. I want to do it. You know? okay. I don't ever feel like it's whack. <laughs> yeah. Um, but in terms of so what you were saying, why did that? At that point, I wrote about it. it was always before that it was abstract. Um, and I just used to talk about it more poetically and using metaphors and images and general general words that I think more people could understand. And I got to the point where... Because you've referenced your mom a few times in the yes, before. Yes, yes. I just got to the point where I wanted to write a letter to her because everything I have and, and, and have been able to do is because of how she raised my brother and I. So it's, it's more like a, a thank you. And I have to do that through my art because art speaks on many more levels than we really understand. And so I had the song, uh, I had the music, and I was making it with India because I was with her in London at the time. And her mother was friends with my mother. So I thought this is perfect because it's like the new generation connecting. So yeah. it's just me giving thanks for that. Uh, and growing up with a photographer mother, like, well, what's that like? Was she always shooting you or was yes. she always at? Because uh, yeah. I've got a photographer girlfriend and she's learned to, you know, Take, like take less photos of me basically because it right. gets frustrating being the guinea pig I mean we, we just got used to it and I always just have these sounds of the camera going off and yeah, yeah. always because 90s it was always analog stuff yeah 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 so um, that's, I'm just used to it it's like block it out basically but um, I never I mean I knew it was unique so I could appreciate it in that sense but we quickly got used to it it wasn't a it wasn't a thing has it helped you with like fashion side of things like modeling and stuff um yeah i think people because i've been told before i'm easy to photograph i think that must be where it comes from i just have natural training not by choice so because you and your brother both do modeling right occasionally like if a, if a gig comes up but people and, ask but it's yeah. like you're with an agency no 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 we got approached at one point um by an agency and we sat down with a contract and we almost did it but there was a clause oh, that was like we have to say in all of our like social media that we signed with them and there's the email address and we were like but no because that's not our mission yeah our, but, our mission is not to promote yeah. you guys our mission is to be promoted by you yeah, guys yeah, to yeah. get work through yeah. you guys so yeah now we had to decline unfortunately but it was yeah we've been approached before but not with the agency okay and what's your relationship like with your brother it seems really dope like, yes i mean i don't know your brother well at all i kind of only know about him because of you like, right so like i see like what you share of his work and that yeah um i mean we're twins so that's as dope as it, a sibling relationship can get probably so very close um but also very different unique individual and you need that yeah um, but you're both artistic you're both like i mean you obviously unique people 
But you both have that. I guess, would it be because of the upbringing there? Like your parents just being so open to you being self-expressive? Yes, so we're always encouraged to do art. We were never um, discouraged from it. And again, that's just a blessing because I know a lot of people's parents don't want them to go into art at all. And yeah, a lot of people struggle doing other stuff. So, blessed yeah. again. But, okay, you keep saying this, like I'm blessed. Yeah. Do, you, do you ever feel guilty about it? Um, I know because why like okay. unless unless i know i'm hurting somebody or unless i'm indirectly hurting somebody which i think we all do in several ways oh, of course as just humans. waking up every day exactly you're like destroying so planet that's i think you know and then i know i've not i'm not a perfect person so i know what i've done in this life that you know i can be guilty for so i'm not going to expend that on on just how i was born you know what i mean or who oh, my parents yes. were they worked yes. extremely hard to to be in that position and their parents did as well so yeah, and then, but at the same time, you have the, like you say, you've got this mission to, like, actually help the world. So yeah. it's not like you're someone who's, like, going, I'm privileged, I acknowledge I've got privilege, but fuck that. You're like, how do I actually do stuff with this? Right, so yeah, I just figured out that the way I can do that is just being who I am and doing my music. Because I've actually had people approach me before and say, bruh, like, your song woke me up in the morning and helped me go and do my day. And then that's all I can ask for. And if I did that, I'm happy. And I've already done that, so so that's what I can do is just continue to try and give that to people. It's it's a, it's a gift. I think doing art is, a, is you give a gift out to the world, and then that's what you can do as an artist. Okay. And you said so you started creating music when you were in grade ten. Um. Okay. So I first started like trying to make mu sounds from like thirteen, fourteen. Okay. Um. But I was never serious about making songs until. Like, yeah, like 16. What, what so, were you thinking about when you were like 13, 14? Like, you, you were playing around with this, but what was the goal? At last? Just you trying like, to be cool, man, and trying to stand out. And because, like, in high school, coming from that uh, government school so background. So, to get some checks? Like, no, no, it was no, just no. to represent more. Okay. And then, and yeah, but also, the, you know, going out and partying, you know how teenagers are. And just wanted to be that guy. Because I was always into hip hop. I was listening to hip hop from a very young age. Cause, were like, you the guy busy doing, like, ciphers and, like, rapping with, like, you know, rapping in the corner? I, I can't say no because I've, I've just had a flashback or two but also don't want to say yes because I wasn't that corny annoying guy <laughs> I was just very much into hip hop like all the greats basically and trying to be like that and used to watch their movies and, and just you know do like them so I started trying to do beats and uh, like when I was 16 started to sample and learn how sampling worked because I was surrounded by guys who were doing that and trying to start to make cool stuff and literally as it started to get cool that's when my mother passed away and i fell into a very bad depression i didn't touch any music for like over a year after that i mean that's completely understandable. yeah right? yeah like, and like because the world just disappears at that point and nothing matters to you so yeah and, but then the, a year later did making music help you come out of that yeah so what happened was um i, I don't know i feel like most people should know this about me but n not many people do so what happened was um i was visiting a cousin of mine uh with my brother and at one point like it was just after the the year anniversary of her passing and i remember just laying in bed i wasn't getting up i was just nothing mattered to me the rest of the family was doing something and i was just there and i don't know why but i just turned around and i saw a computer and i went up to it and i opened garage band and i I just made this beat that I just came out of me and it was the best thing I'd ever made no exaggeration the first time I picked up in over a year was the best thing I ever made and I was like oh immediately I changed I was like if I don't do this I'm a fool if I don't do this this beat right here I'm gonna just stay in that bed for the rest of my life so I immediately wrote down lyrics I wrote down the plan for a music video I went back to Joburg oh, recorded it I went and recorded a studio, did the video for that, it became Cranes, which was the first song I put out, which led to my first EP. And then I'm, I'm not exaggerating when I say that's why I'm sitting in front of you right now. It's because of that, that beat I made that just randomly got me out of bed that one day. Fuck, so, yeah. <laughs> so life would have been so differently had you gotten up and done something else that day. Like 100% or if I just didn't open a computer. Yeah, or if, but do it you, just came you, in my head. Do you think you wouldn't somebody ever got you? Do you think you needed that moment? Definitely, because because everything I've done is directly related to that since that time, and that's why I always say like if you knew me during and before that time and you still know me and we're still friends, 
that you're my friend for life, like your family. What, well, because Cause they I'm, stuck through with you? Yeah, because right? I lost a lot of lot of friends at that time. Were you like a dickhead to them, or were they just unable to deal with the sadness? So what happened was, uh, sorry for the specifics, but um, it came a point where it was the day of my mother's funeral, and I just decided I'm not going to expend energy keeping anyone around. And if people care about me, they'll holler. Yeah. And a lot of people didn't. And I never, ever, to this day... You haven't heard from them since. And I haven't sent them anything. And I'm, I don't care because I was literally at my worst and you weren't there. And there were people who were there and th that's who I give my energy to. I think we all go through phases like that in our lives. Not necessarily with something so hectic, something so big, like something so debilitating. But there are, like... And also, maybe not so young, but throughout my life you know that's happened you know like when you're at your lowest in that and you look around and you go who's actually fucking here today who's actually who are my friends right 100 percent. who are my actual friends and you know it's horrible to like look back and go fuck i've got so few friends yeah but at the same time it's a wonderful thing to know that i've got these true friends these yes 100 percent actually believe in me these people who actually care so much about me that you know like even when i'm at my worst they still like there for me and yeah. yeah spot on i'd rather have that than a ton of people who aren't there so yeah that's why like just as i've gotten older i've kind of cut down my friend circle as much as possible i mean i don't think you should happier. do it intentionally but it's not, not like <laughs> not like go like i need less friends but look at your own life and go like are these people making me happy? Are these people caring about my happiness? Yeah, you, you know, know it's, like, yeah, it's like when you need somebody, that's when they'll show up, when you really need somebody. And if they don't, then, you know what I mean? I mean, don't get me wrong, everybody goes through shit. They might also be going through shit, yeah. but put it on the table. Don't yeah. don't just disappear, don't ghost. Because yeah. you can ghost someone at the wrong time and then it's done for you. Yeah, <laughs> I wonder, like, yeah, I wonder how many people, like, like, we could look back at our own lives and go, shit, man, like, what if that guy that like I cut out was also going through something at that time? Yeah. But you never know because you never actually speak about it. It's a weird thing about us dudes though. Like we are like that. Like we don't necessarily as well. Like because I mean, it, it could also be maybe be an unhealthy thing in that like you cut these people out of your life. You've never spoken to them again. And you've, neither you nor them have got that resolution. There's always this weird thing of like, oh, well, fuck you then. I, w I would say that I didn't intentionally no, no, cut them you, out. But, yeah. but the fact that they never messaged me and I never messaged them. It happened by default. Yeah. Because I still won't send you a message. Like, for what? And now it's... When was that? Almost eight years. So, cool. A decade's gone by. And we still have chatting. Yeah. So, we're probably okay. Yeah. But it does, obviously doesn't weigh on you that much anymore. Like, those relationships. No. Because, yeah. Because I'm... I guess it's also a blessing that at the time when those relationships and you're just a teenager and it's just your mates or whatever. It's not really yeah. that deep. You know what I mean? So... To, to have that happen at that point, I mean, it's not that much of a loss, I might, I might say. Yeah, but, yeah. And your friend circles these days, who are you, who are you rolling with? Um, so, the guys at the Charles Jean Suite, yeah, um, yeah. I'm with them a lot. Um, who else are my friends? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, do you know why it's difficult? Because a lot of them are just doing amazing, crazy things. Like, my one friend, Sim Nikki, where she's in Norway right now, on the residency, also art. Um, my other friend, she's completing a master's degree. But you're like in art circles fully, like no, no, no. no. I know some guys in tech. I know some guys in um, my one friend. She's learning education, teaching. So it's not only music. I'm, I'm, I don't want it only to be music. I yep. know someone who's doing medicine at the moment, but she's also a filmmaker. So it's, that's it's crazy. So so <laughs> that's very crazy. But that's also cool. You want to have a very well, wide right. horizon you know you don't want to just because what can happen when you just zoned in on your industry or, or and that's all it can just drown you and trap you especially if you feel like you're not doing well and, and others around you you feel like you don't get support you're going to think that's it and sometimes that's not it oh you know? yeah taking a step back and really like that's something i deal with a lot is just that like support thing like i get so frustrated like seeing like not people who i think are lesser but like people who like I don't necessarily connect with their art right. and like, I'm like why do people not connect with my art but they connect with their art why are they like getting the success and I'm not and like yeah it's so important like when I'm in those headspaces just remove myself yeah. from the scene yeah. just remove myself from those external like things yeah. that are busy fucking with me because yeah. at the end of the day it is own lane 
you know, yeah. like race kind of thing. It's not a good space to be in when you start thinking like that. Are those things you worry about? I mean, because, like, I see, I would never have expected that from you. Um, you know, I mean, you're a human being. I've had, like, yeah, I've had those feelings, but then I realized that I was focusing on the wrong things. And, like, so, like you said, took a step back, started focusing on what I'm not doing, which was at that point actually composing music. Because coming into hip hop, you just try and put beats together, which yeah. means chopping up samples, throwing drums on it. No mixing. Yes. <laughs> you just record your vocals and then that's the song. And, and I realized I, I want to know more. And me looking at so-and-so doing A, B, and C is not going to help me learn that. So let me just ignore that and just focus on myself. Like, so, I know it's corny to say focus on yourself, but yeah, yeah it helped. So you say composing music, you mean like actually writing a full song? Learning theory, learning instruments, learning how to read and write music, everything like that. So, I'm so currently, you've been doing that? Yeah, yeah, currently learning that. Helping a lot, man. Okay, where are you learning it? Um, so, self-taught, okay. um, but I'm also taking bass lessons from Shane Cooper, aka Carlos oh, Post. <laughs> if there's someone, Plug. If there, yeah, if there's anyone to learn an instrument from in this country, yeah. Shane Cooper's probably yeah. one of the best you can learn from. Definitely. So, Damn, dude, that's so cool. How yeah. did you guys meet up? How did that happen? Um, well, I knew, I knew him like just from the scene, I guess, a couple yeah. of years back or whatever, but then he actually put out on his social media, I'm going to teach bass if you want to pay for a slot, just come through. Oh, and so that's simple. Yeah, I already had the guitar, so I was like, oh, I want to go learn bass. So it was just literally just a public thing. And what have you learned from bass? Like learning bass in comparison to, you know, just chilling um, at home with, like, with, with keys. Okay, oh, so, you, oh, do you, so you play keys. Learn, I'm still keys, learning keys. Still yeah. Because okay. yeah. originally just a laptop garage band. It's put some things in. Plugins, it does everything drum, for you. Yeah, Reason and, and Fruity Loops and, and all that, that. And now you're having to learn the timing yourself. You're having to like actually like not just go, cool, this is the timing of the beat. You're actually now having to go, fuck, this is the timing. Yeah, yeah like it's very much, it's different when you get all of your muscles involved. Yeah. And, and you literally become what you play. And that, that's not to say that hip hop producers aren't like that. They are, especially oh, people who use drum machines and that's it's a lot of finger stuff going on. So, um... It's just different now because I think the main difference is on a keyboard, you go left to right usually. And on a guitar, it's the other way around. Mm -hmm. That was confusing, but I figured it out. So Okay, just yeah. that, that's the smallest thing. Like what I found myself doing was listening to different genres and then trying to play along with the bass. And I noticed that where I was putting my fingers was the keys one. <laughs> and then somebody who actually knew was like, no, because that note is not down here, it's up here. It's and I was like, what? So it's been, it's just like, I don't know. I think when you teach yourself something and you have the drive to teach yourself something, there's just a different passion around it. It's not like sitting down in school and being thrown information. Yeah, but mm -hmm. it's also like when you learn something like that, you're also going to learn it in ways that maybe, like like you say there, it's now d different for you because when you're playing bass, you're like, oh, that note's up there because you've taught yourself how to play keys, right? So you've learned it in a certain way and you know notes now, but you haven't like, transposed that note on like in terms of sheet music and that essentially or have you yeah i could you could yeah okay, but i mean like <laughs> in terms of like in your mind you haven't gone oh that's actually there on a bass though like well yeah now now i have before i didn't so okay. that's the biggest difference it's just yeah i don't know music is just so wide and expansive and i know that people because some friends of mine will play the trumpet that's a whole other thing and i'm not ever trying to play the trumpet because i respect the craft too much but there's it's, so much there with yeah, wind instruments yeah oh. and your fingers and your breath as well and holding yeah. notes it's just a whole other strenuous thing so all my love and respect to people play the trumpet yeah definitely the most uh, talented people in ska bands were always the whole section yeah, for yeah, me yeah. <laughs> like and um, yeah in terms of influences and that you seem like a cat who listens to everything like you were saying earlier with, in terms of rap you know um, the classics and that who were the classics for you so I'm probably the biggest outcast fan in, okay. in the continent and I say that with my chest because I have all the albums physical I have a bunch of merchandise the clothing line <laughs> just since I was a kid collection so like Andre 3000, big boy. I mean, you're not like, I'm, I'm actually thinking about it now. You're definitely not like Andre 3000 in attitude, but there are bits of flow there that actually subtle. Like I think everyone copies that dude, man. And even yeah. big boy as well. Yeah. Everybody. They just steal that flow, man. Cause that's, that's the iconic flow. So only hip hop album to win Grammy for album of the year was theirs. So everyone just jacks that. <laughs> but yeah, I grew up listening to that mainly. So the whole dungeon family stuff, even like a goodie mob, uh, organized noise everyone who was doing those those sounds and then their influences come through heavily 
So they're inspired by a lot of old like funk stuff, like Parliament, Funkadelic, uh, George Clinton, all those guys in blues. So did you go back to all of that, or did you kind of know about yeah, that no, stuff o- before? over time. So okay. like even since I was a kid, they'd always reference those people directly, and then I'd go and listen as well. So just a whole lot of funky stuff. I like funk music. I like how they're. That's literally like some of the first experimental music was funk music, but I also like a lot of traditional indigenous music from africa from asia from everywhere yeah i've kind of noticed that about you just like, how they yeah do the different scales and things like that and it just sounds it sounds real and genuine to me and i don't think we should have the term world music that makes zero sense everything has its own genre you hey, know. bro i'm on harrison with you world music's just such a it's a lazy term yeah that, you know we music journalists use and it's also it's the western music you know media yes yeah. but also you know south african media is western in a lot of ways so like yeah have people use that when they describe some of your like beats and stuff like have they gone like world music influence and that so um, is that why it's an issue for you or no no i'm just speaking generally okay. i don't think there should be one award category for people who are coming from mali and ethiopia and brazil and, and make it completely different fucking 100%. music percent like it's not even anywhere near the same genre of music and yet you have people going this is the same <laughs> Yeah, but oh. we we got to deal with it. But one thing I have noticed in Africa particularly is that... Everything's Afrobeats now. But that the the stuff that is classified as world music is young Africans don't necessarily want to listen to that. They want to listen to the Afrobeat stuff and the hip-hop. Mm. But then that's not considered in the same category as the African music. A lot of that world stuff is predominantly consumed by a Western market, which I'm not saying is a bad thing, but is gonna distort what some people think is going on on the continent of what actually is. actually get you there because there is that uh, kind of like the stereotype of you know the white person who listens to world music <laughs> i mean like, big ups them because they put their money down so it's it's good but like of course like and it, but it's like that is the weird thing though is that like if you kind of think about it like they support a lot of artists yeah 100 percent. like yeah fuck, man. and like most bob marley fans i know have been white girls so <laughs> bless up <laughs> 100 percent actually it's so weird man like just thinking about that just thinking about the dynamics of these things that like yeah you have someone like bob marley who you know revolutionary in his own right also problematic in his own right but is this icon to so many people who at the same time probably wouldn't agree with anything bob marley actually stood for like, right. but they love his music or maybe like, on principle but they don't live it you know no. I mean? well there's yeah. that as well yeah i mean yeah pe- yeah people's actions and their actual words are quite different that got deep <laughs> <laughs> uh do you like with your music and that do you ever worry i mean but i guess you're not too image focused like i guess early on you did have a bit of an image focus with your art yes, and stuff yeah and you've moved away from that yeah it's not it's not if you're doing music that shouldn't be your primary focus you're gonna have a very shallow time did you feel that that eventually yeah like it got to a point where i was i got a booking or two and the people who booked me didn't know my music had never listened to it can you because someone who books artists yourself can you imagine booking someone who've never listened to Ever. I've had people try that that I'm you know when I'm working with them and stuff you know being like hey let's get this artist on with where's their music I'm like oh don't worry they can play it early so I'm like no like what, what does it sound like <laughs> so what happened on at least two occasions was I'd get to the venue and the, re- the rest of the artists would be doing something entirely different like trap so now you have a trap crowd oh God, with you. and then I come on and I'm headlining at midnight and then I'm not doing no trap and my shit's mellow and crazy as hell and people are just uh, you know they start they just go on their phones and talk to each other and just staring at the stage like who the hell is this because what's going they, on they didn't know who you were and the and, and the booking agent was mad at me and i was like you book me though like what do you, you put me so at 12 I, o'clock, like- I realized he didn't know my music so then i realized well how did he oh because I, I knew so and so i was out at this and this and it's like that's not important because you're just gonna have a bad time you have to put it in the music and everything else will follow like but did you find like because like i'd say like so you kind of were on like a blow up trajectory like a little while ago from my i'm saying from your perspective perspective, you know you were you know you were doing photo shoots and stuff you were looking fly you were in videos you were making dope songs people your name was getting out there you were getting books just based on your name right like you know that's subtly starting to blow up and then you seemed to take a step back you know you also the image thing kind of shifted you stopped kind of doing the whole like i look cool like you yeah. know, that kind of thing yeah. you started to just be like 
I'm just a regular dude making some dope music. Okay, so I'm gonna just be completely honest. Um, so what happened was when I had that first beat, that first song, that first video, that first EP. At that point, me being where I was as a 17 year old, I couldn't stay there. So yeah. I had to give it to the world. Perhaps I wasn't ready, but I just put it out there and I said, this is me, this is what I do, and this is what I'm gonna do. It's and so that you do it when you're 17. Like, yeah. yeah. And I had to follow it. So what that meant was being thrown into the deep end when I wasn't ready. And so I would be out there and trying to get a show, and I'm like, but you only have three songs, we can't give you a show. So, okay, pressure now, let me work on an album. What do people want to hear? But I never did that. I always just did what felt right. Three or four songs at a time, tiny EPs here and there. And if I get a show, I just put maybe six or seven of them together and just draw it out. And that's what I was doing. I was really writing. I didn't have a lot to write on, but I was writing nonetheless. But what that can mean is that you are just in over your head a little bit. And so I just was like, you know, I need to actually learn more. I want to learn how to mix. I want to learn how to play these instruments. I want to learn how to... Because also a lot of people... When you okay, if you're in a hype situation and the hype dies down, a lot of people aren't going to be around you no more. The suddenly the dude who was booking you is not going to book you again. The dude who was doing your interviews is, is gone. So I was like, okay, if I'm by myself, because I can see it can happen now. It never completely happened, luckily. But if I'm by myself, how can I maintain? Okay, learn how to mix, learn an instrument, learn about copyright law, learn about music. So I went and I researched courses. I enrolled at ASC Academy of Sound Engineering, still there, uh, learning mixing, learning everything. Um, and that's why you can say I've taken a step back. I never wanted to because I need this shit. But um, if you said, oh, okay, it's, it's been taken, that's what it was. But I mean, just because that's the thing. Also, I don't know you, dude. Like, so, like, like, I only know you from the internet. I only know you right. once or twice. So, you know, it's just, I'm just saying how things appear to me because it's also like, you know, in terms of artists, you like, especially for someone like me, you look at their, their output, yes. essentially, you know, yes. when, when are they putting stuff out, how often are they putting stuff out, and you can kind of get a sense of where they are in their lives based on their productivity. Right. Like, you know, artists are usually more productive when they're happier. Like, yes. they usually yes. go through periods where they don't release shit for a year. You t- chat to them, like, yeah, things were fucking fucked then. And, and I like, can say this, that since I enrolled in that college, the opposite has happened. So I've got more, I'm sitting now on more songs than I had when I started and between when I rolled in, which was almost four years. In that time, I made up maybe about 10, 12 songs. I've got way more than that in the past year or two. And But now you're more conscious of releasing them in certain ways. It, yeah, it has to be right. It has to be right. I'm not going to compromise that. Um, I've been doing shows. I've been So I haven't been out there, but if I got a booking, I went and did the show. So I did a few festivals, um, shows here and there, traveled as I could, um, and dropped those two songs this year. So... I'm still doing it. I'm not. Yeah, you're still you. doing it. I never said you're not still doing it. I just said it seemed like you took, took a bit of a step back. So I was just wondering. Yeah, no, that's what it was. So I just putting my head down, learning what I should have known and didn't. Even though I'm not blaming myself because no one was teaching me those things. So, are you grateful you didn't blow up at that time? Yes, hundred <laughs> percent. I don't. It depends what you mean by blowing up, but yeah. Well, like getting more successful, like you know, having like your name and likes fucking so, bookings, yeah like, so what i wouldn't signed, what i shit. wouldn't want is getting all those things and then the people around you are fickle or or fake and those things aren't on solid ground i think if you have those things you need to build them on solid foundations and that's what i've been working on those foundations instead of the image of it or the hype of it or the lights those things they come they come but i need to have the foundations i need to have the music yeah it's also it's about i mean i guess you also realize that you've got a bit of time like you know like when you're younger you might not necessarily see that and as you get older you're like yeah i can you know i can learn these things i can get better at my art by the time i'm 30 imagine the stuff i can create you know once i've got all of these things behind me whereas had you like with your first ep you know like gotten more successful off of it there's that potential that you don't learn all these things you've learned now you know there's that potential that you go down this different path where you're actually not as good an artist. Hundred percent. And what happens is you get to a point where someone's like, "But I know all these things, trying to get to where you are, and you don't know none of that. And why are you there? Yeah. You know what I mean? And I, I didn't want to ever. <laughs> there, may, there may be one I or always two. Always worry about that. As a <laughs> Look, I'm always worried about. I mean, that. like I said, I'm not mad at myself because I had to do it. I had no choice. And so, I'm blessed. Again, I know I keep saying it, but damn. I had to get there somehow, even if it meant going in prematurely, because I could never learn soon enough. And if I finish the degree next year, then I'll have it out the way and I know what I know now and just can move forward. And 
yeah, still just trying to do amazing music for people. So. Yeah, as you said, you're doing sound engineering now. Um, so obviously you don't want to just create music, you want to do the full range, you want to help other people with their music as well, or is it just for yourself that you're learning these things? Right, so no one was mixing my shit, and I thought I knew what I was doing, but I didn't. And then my, my homeboy Ella at one point was like, bruh, okay, yeah, I get what you're doing, but why isn't them knocking though? And I'm like, bro, what do you mean it's knocking? He's like, nah, and he played me something. And I'm like, bro, because they know that shit. And he's like, and I'm like, so you're going to teach me? And he's like, bro, so I went and just taught myself. So it, okay. it is for myself, but as a part of a group and a collective, if they need assistance, I'm down 100% because that's family. So Yeah, but also externally, would it not be something that you'd look at oh, for? Oh, definitely. Like yeah, yeah, 100%. Like. Yeah, maybe on the side because I just want to do my art as a primary focus. But if it comes, it comes. How do you plan on doing that? Your art is your primary focus in terms of money, in terms of sustainability, because it ain't fucking easy. Man. Yeah, true. I just keep releasing, keep writing, keep composing, uh, keep doing videos, putting it out there. But like, is the money coming from live performances, from selling tracks, from okay, um, um, from licensing to you know like so yeah, I've, yeah, royalties and shows is yeah. my primary. Yeah, and also like agency brand stuff if I do a modeling thing or mostly shows okay so but you just have to have new stuff to do shows <laughs> is that the key like I mean no because you can have a classic and then still get booked off your classic oh, so but, many people do that and they're yeah. still making their money and like just as a promoter like I fucking hate that but yeah but also just my life has changed and so sometimes I'm not always talking about the same things as I was before so I want to talk about what's happening now to a crowd and so I just keep doing what I'm doing which is being an artist so, do you, so like um, you don't do any old songs anymore when you perform oh no I do especially that first one because okay. it's, it's also it? a banger but um, my set's always changing so and there's a lot of new stuff now yeah I haven't actually got to see you live yet what are your sets like like do you like to like what do you talk about in between like do you do banter with the crowd yeah or, just because I sometimes have to tell a story about a track for it to make sense because yeah. my stuff is quite left field a lot of people might not get it otherwise yeah you do like I mean what's dope about you is you do send explanations of your stuff like you know with your songs yeah. like which you know everyone kind of does but you do it quite well which I quite appreciate like I appreciate getting the full context of the song it's some, but I mean, at the same time, I also like interpreting things myself. But it's yes. nice to get what the artist actually meant and wanted from it. I think for me, sorry about that. No, um, for me, I just the way I don't, don't want to be misunderstood. No, but I deliberately. Well, there's also there's always that. But I deliberately um, don't set out to. Okay, now I'm gonna write a song. It just comes to me, and that happens. I think. I mean, I don't know, but because of context. Yeah. So that's why I give the context, because that's the space I was in for that music to come through me. When you say that, like, do you, do you literally sit down and, like, the music comes out of you? Or do you have to think about, like, it, okay, it, this here, any this random situation, it will come to me, and then I have to put it down somehow. So, like, that song, Summer Evening with India Shan, I was on the aeroplane, literally, trying to pass <laughs> out. Your and stuff? Bro, this is what happened. So <laughs> I was on the aeroplane trying to pass out, and then... I don't know, these keys and these drums just came to me like, I was trying to literally, I was closing my eyes and then boom, boom, and I'm like, okay, excuse me, let me go. And then I took my phone, went to the toilet, closed the door, voice, voice memo app, just sang the beat, sang the melody, vocals here and there. Okay, cool. When I get to London, I'm recording it. And then I can sit down and, but it, I can't sit down with nothing beforehand yeah, yeah. and just create from scratch a lot of producers so can't they, they, they just have to come and it's sometimes annoying because i can't choose it like four in the morning i'm sleeping it comes or i'm on a bus and it comes or i'm walking in the street and that's frustrating in joburg because i can't oh, just pull God, out my you, phone oh. so sometimes i just Fuck, dude i hate that about <laughs> like it's the biggest change for me it's like i can't just walk around catch a fucking pokemon hey Man. nah it's lit bro you'll see your life <laughs> yeah. they'll make you the pokemon catch Ex your ass exactly <laughs> but that's funny because Muzi actually, like, um, he, like, I don't know if he still works like that, but he used to be like that very much, like, songs just come to him. Like, yeah, that's, and, like, yeah. He, like, and he would be like, yeah, dude, like, I have to pull out my phone and just start, like, singing the beats so that, like, I don't forget. Yeah, same, and I have tons of those voice memos which I haven't even gone through yet. But if I'm in town and walking and it comes, I just have to keep, <laughs> keep in my keep, head, keep going like, beatboxing. And to be fair, that looks normal. It doesn't look super strange, yeah. so it's cool. Uh, it's the worst, though, like, as a comedian because, like... 
if you can't if you can't like quickly write down the idea or quickly say the idea you've got to try to keep that one thought in your head over and over and it's so difficult to do that because like you keep veering off of it and you just like the number of jokes that like I've lost because of like just not having pen and paper with me or not like having my phone by me and I'm just like and by the time I get to that I can't remember the exact word yeah, and it's so way. frustrating and it's happened to me a good few times where I think I'm gonna remember it <laughs> yep. and then that's always you think you go and then an I hour goes by nope it's gone and you're like shit hopefully like two years later it comes back to you out of nowhere you know what yeah the mind can do that hopefully there's actually a time for it can't remember because I've had that happen where like even on stage, like, I'll be, like, telling jokes and stuff, and all of a sudden, this joke that, like, I thought of two years ago that I forgot about, <laughs> that, like, I really thought, like, came up on a random day, all of a sudden, it just comes out of your mouth, like, in that stage, and you're like, oh, fuck yeah, that's yeah. a joke I have. Like, that's what that joke was. So, it can actually, like, in music, it can go bad because you might have heard something. Oh, God. Like, I mean, what, dude, we have that no, same I mean, Yeah, and you then you put it down, and you would be thinking it's original. Fortunately, there's actually a clause in a lot of copyright law that if you can prove that that's what happened or if you didn't know that that's what you were doing, you're really, there's no malicious intent. You weren't trying to jack or something. So they let you off. Yeah, there, I mean, yeah, copyright law, there's a few different, I mean, there's a lot, I mean, you're learning this now, it's yeah, all okay. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, there's so many aspects. So what's the most fascinating thing you've learned so far out of it? Um, oh, pretty much that. Uh, I should get permission for samples because oh, I should, used yeah. to sample and I've actually taken some stuff down because I didn't clear it yeah. um, just the respect for the original artists like I didn't because again hip hop that's what you do yeah. and it's no it's no biggie because that's what it is so and so, so most people aren't releasing their tracks for money so you don't need to get yeah to and like, in yeah. the beginning I wasn't I mean when I started it was still SoundCloud there was no Spotify or Apple Music yeah. I mean they were there but they weren't like the place to go so I wasn't making any royalties so um, but then since I've gone on there, I'll make sure, okay. And I have sampled now, but I clear the samples. Learning how to clear the samples was very useful. So, like on Sahara Flow, that's a sample I cleared. So, uh, what, what sample? It's the lady singing okay. in, in, on the chorus, yeah. And how do you find samples and how do you now get in touch with the people? Mm, to clear that's the hard part. The reason it doesn't happen is because a lot of people just don't know where to go or what to do. So, you could just be digging through records and you find it's a very hip hop thing, I should yeah. say. No one should intentionally go and find a random record and then rework it. But uh, so many people I know do that. Hip hop, so. hip hop, that's what it is. So, you find the jamming, you make a beat. I mean, there's people who literally make samples now or songs to sample. Like, so all you got to do on the back of the record sleeve or whatever on the iTunes page of the album there's a record company's name yeah. and you should just google their A&R they usually have a website some email address you should contact they actually want you to legally sample because they can get a royalty yeah, split a or, a set or, or a clearance fee or something so people shouldn't be intimidated to do that if you have the, the PR skills to do it you should do it definitely yeah, cause also, I think people are worried that oh then I'm going to lose money on this but at the same time, if you've actually got the label and the artist's consent, there's also the option that they might even promote the song exactly, for you. Exactly, like, yeah. Not, like, that's so small a chance. But it is a cool thing that could actually happen. Yeah. And you're also developing a relationship with the label. You're developing a cool professional relationship. You're coming across to everyone. 100%. As a professional artist. 100%. That's an aspect. Yeah, definitely super important aspects of all of this so yeah learning how to clear samples um, also learning the different ways you can make money like I didn't know that Samro was a thing which is our government body of music have they paid you anybody no. yet? <laughs> I, I literally just signed up with them so that's I mean, not gonna people, happen nah like a lot of people do get their money out of them and a lot of people also don't get all the money that's owed to them from them uh, there's a lot of big issues when it comes to Samro I mean I worked in radio so it's all good Hey, what's up, man? How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not holding my breath for that. Um, again, mostly what I get is my aggregator royalties, which is different from Samro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then performance fees. So. But I mean, well, the Samro stuff comes from radio and that. And you don't Ra get a lot of yeah, radio, but also if you, if 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 you ever perform live, you can tell them what you performed, and they can pay you for that because yeah, it's a public the performance. Yeah, because play that fee as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not yeah, a lot of venues don't even pay that fee, yeah. so they could be getting into cuck. But so yeah, <laughs> so I do that. I've notified, I've sent them a notification or two, but I mean, literally this year I signed up, so there's all processing and stuff. And How old are you now? 24. Okay. Just turned 24. It's a good, yeah. good age to start like doing the 
the paperwork stuff properly. Yeah, hundred percent. I le- I like just went legit recently <laughs> from a street cat. I'm still a street cat though, but, but yeah. Have you set up like a business and stuff? No, not not there yet. Nah, not registered or anything. Um, okay. I kind of don't want to be because I'm just so free with it, you know. And I don't want to monetize my name. I know that it's going to happen because if I'm performing under my name, it is monetizing yeah. my name. But I don't want to deliberately monetize my name. So, well, have you thought about using another art, like another name for your artist? I never came up with a good one ever. That's why I started with Sam Turpin, just my real name, because I never came up with a good one. Tried, couldn't do it. So. What were some of the options? Ah, man. I only remember one, which is the, that Looney Tunes character, Yosemite Sam. I like that. Just because he's a badass and he's just had, he's got those guns that he just Somebody draws out. Yeah. yeah, but I, I didn't fit, and especially as it's very no, American. That, so. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. like your music and that name. Nah, would no, not, no. Would not make sense. So I was like, nah, let me not do that. Um, but I'm not open to. I mean, you know, I am open to maybe an alternative identity if I'm doing different production stuff, or because I'm learning now all these new sounds, I could go in another direction. But that's so what I was gonna say. See. Do you want to get into different kinds of music? Because all your stuff's pretty down tempo, like for yourself, you know. Like, so would you ever create this other artist that's more high energy? Or um, like- probably not deliberately. Like, if it comes, it comes. But um, I've also done some jingles before, which forces you out of your comfort zone. Because okay. this radio station was like, "Okay, we need one jazz, one African sounding one," and then you have to do that. You have a brief. Yeah. So I've been able to achieve that bless up and also as part of the collective Charles Jean Suite called Chinese Food that's very genre bending they might do stuff that sounds like jazz that sounds like house that sounds like rock because the one guy no he was in a, an indie rock band called Go Barefoot have you booked yeah, it? I know that yeah. Yeah. so Noah from there yeah he started Charles Jean Suite with Ella so, okay yeah okay sweet it's very genre crazy Cool. I'll ask you. So we've got some patrons on the Patreon account. Uh, oh, okay. And there's, I ask them. They can ask questions. And one of them is my girlfriend Paige, who loves your music. And hey, shout out Paige. Yeah, one of the one of the ways I got into you, like pretty, like it's through her. And uh, she just wanted to know: Do you ever take breaks from making music and art? Um, like basically to get your head in order, to find inspiration. Yes. Do you ever take a step away from like stuff? Yes. Like, um, Although with sound, it's complicated. So yes, I'll try and take a break, but you always want to have something, even if it's just birds and you want to have ambience, you want to have sound. Do and you record them? I've done, I've done that before and sampled them before, and I'm still going to actually, but um, no, I don't, I don't, so yeah, but I do take a... you just hear them, like, it's still, yeah, it's you, always you, a part of You want to have sound, you never want complete silence. So that's why I say from sound, it's a difficult thing to answer. So I don't ever cut myself off from sound, but I do try and sometimes... In terms of creating. Yeah, 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 yeah. I definitely take breaks, try not to overdo it because you can burn out. Um, I don't force myself if I'm not feeling it. The, the difference though is in mixing. In mixing, you should force yourself because it's very technical. It's yeah. different from being creative. I mean, you are creative when you mix, but there's a lot of mundane things to get through to get a, so a standard sound. Just get right yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. So um, try not to just burn out. Um, I did go writing in December. I was in Senegal writing a film. So, but that's still art, I guess. Yeah, but it's different kind of art. So like, yeah. That. So I like. But write. do you ever take a break from art? Yeah, 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 yeah. And usually when I do that, I just read, uh, do tai chi as well. Okay. Um, so if I'm ever just want to not have my head in creative mode, I either just mix or read or do Tai Chi or watch films. I love films, like good films. I don't like Hollywood, but good films. I love films. that you break from art is art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, well, no, for me, my break is magic. Like that is like Magic the Gathering, the card game. Oh, a card game. Yeah, yeah. Oh, like, okay. Well, gaming in general, that's like my break from hey, art. Gaming, that's a whole other thing, man. I like, I like Nintendo. Well, and I like I like, I like classic Nintendo like those eight bit Donkey yeah, Kong yeah, yeah, vibes because yeah. I, I get it and arcade arcade shit I get it I don't get other shit that's in gaming that's <laughs> shit so weird to me but let me not trash your, your no, thing. Go, dude you have your fucking opinion <laughs> things, man no like I would uh, okay maybe you can bust this myth for me okay my opinion of a very um, avid gamer is some kid who sits all day in a dank room and he's just on screens all day and he's not healthy and he's doing very mentally taxing things and he's in this world that doesn't exist there so, is that aspect of it yes. okay that's why i'm a bit afraid of it maybe it's my own ignorance that causes that i mean but at the same time we all live in our own world we all live in alternative realities like a lot of the time um for me like it can be unhealthy mm. definitely and i've definitely had unhealthy periods with gaming like no doubt especially when i was younger and that but 
for me, like I got back into gaming because I wanted to essentially stop partying. Right, <laughs> right, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, like trading my addictions <laughs> essentially, yeah. But I find just, so I play Magic the Gathering and it's like, it's a card game and it's forever changing. Like every game's different and it's a, it's forever a mental puzzle that you're just trying to figure okay, out. Okay, you see, see, that, so, see, that's the nice part of gaming I know about, which is um, mental activity. Yeah. And it teaches you puzzle solving, coordination, like, shit, all of that, yeah. memory, you yeah. need good memory, um, and make the ability to make choices, which yeah. I fully appreciate. Yeah. That's the thing. So I, I mean, but also like, I love board gaming and stuff and card gaming oh, as well. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I mean, computer gaming, I'm less into as I get older, essentially. Right. Like, I love like a well designed like board game. I love like a well designed like a cool like card game that you can just bring out like with a group of people. Right. And like it just creates like fun and everyone's got to think a little bit. To, like, yeah, I get that. That's the dope vibe. Um, but again, my own perspective, because just as a, as a child, what we would do is always be some gangster shit like Tekken or GTA yeah, or yeah, like yeah. or Fast and Furious or but, FIFA, the sports games. Yeah. So, Everyone, dude, I played. I, I trained at FIFA, <laughs> even though I hated the fucking game, just because it's the social thing that everyone yeah, does. Yeah, yeah. I would play FIFA at home, not enjoying it, just trying to get better. So you can so beat that, your friends and so shit. So that I could just compete <laughs> like, So, yeah, so then I was like, cool, and then I, I, I'll just read some stuff about unhealthy video games, which yeah. I should maybe um, classify them as, as opposed to other ones. And I was like, this is not good for anybody. And you it's know, also, it's your relationship with them. It's media is such a weird thing because, like, you know, you talk about unhealthy video games, but you look at like movies that are like, oh yeah, just as like problematic in terms of their content and in terms of like, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's again, it's just our lifestyle in this world. We just have to be healthier overall, yeah. and then you can indulge. Balance. Yeah, hundred percent. Everything's balanced, um, and you should also just make sure that whatever you indulge in, to as much as you can. Ensure it doesn't hurt other people, yeah. whether it's family, friends, random people, workers all over the world, whatever. As much as you can personally ensure, because we're all inevitably going to step on somebody, but just try and minimize your impact. And then I think go ham, go crazy, just don't hurt nobody. Yeah, I think you see that's the thing. I think a lot of gamers don't hurt anybody, but there are the there's the the unloved fucking like that, that <laughs> the section. stereotype. The, the stereotype yeah. of just you know the loner you know, hateful in their mom's basement. Like, and they are real. Like, the, those people do exist. And, like... Yeah, man, a couple of them I study with, so I know, like... <laughs> it's, you know, it is truly unfortunate. But at the same time, like, I look at the, a lot of the gaming communities and I see something so completely different, you know? Like, right. I see, you know, the Fortnite World Championships where... I saw like, that shit, like... Millions! <laughs> and, like, but at the same time, like you know they're in a, like a stadium almost and there's everyone watching them like cheering yeah, yeah along. that's a sport like man. You're, you're in a team with other people they've got they've got like psychologists on there like they're like wow. yeah no like the teams for uh, gaming like they've got coaches psychologists nutritionists like dude like it is so insane and like i think esports are the future of sports like Yo. i don't think we're going to have soccer in a hundred years time as a thing because just the moral issues, just the ethical issues yeah. of sports, of watching people kill themselves for your entertainment. Yeah, like, and like big ass grass, like with water and shit. Bro, like, but thank you for inter like educating yeah. me because I didn't know any of that stuff. I literally thought it was just people wasting time. So you've cleared that hey, up. There's <laughs> also a lot of people wasting time, man. But there's, but that's the thing. I mean, it's positive and negative aspects to all of it. I think going out, you know, going to, you know, being a part of the scene is the biggest waste of time sometimes absolutely like, absolutely i can i can there's years of my life that were a complete fucking point like you know and i mean just because of going out like yeah. not the whole year just out of the amount of time that i've spent you know, <laughs> at a club that i didn't need to fucking be there 100 you know 100%. like now, yeah that's not you shouldn't do that <laughs> i mean people i mean if you want to ha go and have fun and socialize yeah, yeah 100%, of course. but you should never force yourself if yeah. you don't, if you, if, if there's that thing in your inside you that's like, ah, maybe I shouldn't, then just listen to it. But when I was younger, yeah. it was like, yeah, it was kind of my job. It was kind of also my identity and purpose was right. like being this dude who goes out. See, know? that's like, different. So you, so you within that, and there's definitely we have that in, in Joburg here. Like even Illa himself, he was part of at one point the skating community. Yeah, yeah. And those guys literally had the plug on everything: hip hop, graffiti, music, um, art you know parties and then to be we also come from that so i have to pay homage to that because he's coming from that and i was around that and 
we owe what we're doing today to those years of, in some ways, formation. Of course. So I can never hate on that. All subcultures is, involve some form of just being out there and just, just living. Oh, bro, I'm not yeah. saying don't go out. Going out <laughs> is the best, and I love it. I'm just saying, like, there's, you know, a lot of it that is obligations. A lot of it, for me, when I was younger, was mm. that, you know, you're just going out because you think it's a thing that you're meant to do. And what oh, was cool yeah. was, as I got older, like... Yeah, the gaming thing just, had, like, it hasn't taken over, but it's become, like, this extra part of my life now where it's like, yeah, I could go out tonight, or I could stay in and play a game, you know, right. like, and they both have the same amount of value to me because they're both just the thing I do for entertainment. 100%. It's no longer, like, a thing that's my identity. Like, going out to an event is no longer, like, a thing that I do to, like, show everyone that I'm going to the event. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's not good. Like, that's I go to the good. events now because I just want to see who's playing. Like, yeah. Because I want to see who's there and be a part of the thing. and be. And, but for me, I do think, like, and it's only something I've realized as I got older, that, yeah, a large part of my fuck you, I don't care what anyone thinks about me thing was very much, hey, bro, look at me. I don't care what you think, but look at me not caring what you think. Yeah, like, yeah. 100%. And just, like, yeah, a large portion of my going out was just wanting attention and wanting... Yeah, all of that. So, <laughs> right. Yeah, it's not always the best for you in the future, at least. No, definitely not. But I'm I'm quite stoked with where I'm at. But it's weird because you seem to be like this cat who's like in his thirties and his twenties. Right. Um. I don't know. Maybe you could say old soul. Yeah. But I don't know, man. I just I don't know. I think just life came at me fast, and I had to quickly prioritize my decisions. Okay. So, so would you say like, obviously the loss of your mom, like was the catalyst yeah definitely really definitely it, it forced me to really look at myself and what i was doing and what was adding value to my existence because you lose so much value at that point and if you got next to none of it left it's like oh i need to start adding now so okay. what's this doing for me what's that doing for me which is why i said as soon as i got that song i had to just go with it i had nothing else so it was and that's why i'm here <laughs> so yeah very grateful for that cool and i'm very grateful for you for spending this hour with me i know you've got some stuff to do after this i'm not going to keep you any longer thank you so much for your time bro uh do you have anything you want to share with us that you got some got coming up soon or yes so out? look out for charles jean suite um there's a new song coming out in a when is this podcast dropping uh will probably be next wednesday for us so. okay in, in in a couple weeks charles jean suite new song coming out and then we're also recording the new cold chinese food album under them oh you're doing a whole album yeah that's a whole album that's coming out um, so look out for those. I'll be featured on a lot of those, uh, including the album itself, and also some solo stuff. We're doing some visuals for Sahara Flow. Um, oh, cool! Yeah, definitely. So that's also on the way. So just keep your finger on the pulse. If you haven't heard Sahara Flow, go listen to it. If you haven't heard Summer Evening, go listen to it. If you haven't heard Foyim and Josie, go listen to it. <laughs> Even though I'm probably going to take it down soon. Oh, uh, unclear samples. Oh, I but, actually did want to ask you one more question. Before yes. We go. It's a bit of a tough one, but the young and lazy stuff, did you take down the I, I took, the, I took them that? down, yeah. I so took them down. For people who don't know, uh, one of the guys in Young and Lazy, I, I don't know the full thing, but has been accused of some pretty fucked up shit. Yeah. And you worked with them like a little bit or a lot. Um, I just, I yeah, they're, they're, I just thought they were cool, so I put uh, all their stuff in my videos and then I worked for them at Fashion Week yeah. um, at one point. That was my extent of relationship with them and supporting them with my money and when i saw that happen i was like i don't want people to look at my art and be reminded of anything terrible whatever happened i don't know any details but as far as i'm responsible for having supported that and enabled aspects of it even if well, yeah, i so much of like popular culture so much of south african culture yes you know, enabled that essentially. So I was like, nah, I'm going, I'm going to pull these videos, man. And I just feel guilty for having indirectly played a minor role in, in just giving this was money. It, you know? Was it a tough decision for you to pull those videos since they're like these personal projects? Like they're like, it's more than just, you know, this one small, small, I'm putting in inverted commas there. Right. Like aspect of it, the small association that you've got with, you know, this problematic person with a brand. But your, it's your whole entire artistic project. So, so I'll, like, I'll say this. The, the art is not gone forever. And, and the songs are still there. Yeah. So what I might do is just edit the videos, blur out the logos, okay. and then put it back up. Because it's still what I'm saying is still what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm not advocating anything like that. It's literally just me wearing the brand. Yeah. And then whatever that says to people, I didn't want that to reflect on what I'm trying to bring into the world, which is just my own light. 
you yeah. know so i might just cut the logos and put it back we'll see okay but the, like yeah, yeah i respect that you did that though because i don't know how many artists would have made that choice you know like, i mean I, I did it immediately i was just yeah, like no, mm. i saw that like that, that's, <laughs> that's what was so like interesting about it was like it didn't seem like it was this like thing you even had to like struggle with it was just no. like ah no fuck that i'm removing this now like i mean my mother used to tell me about things that w- would happen to her and just because of older guys yeah, and shit. I can't imagine the trouble she so for <laughs> for me i never ever want any woman to feel hurt uh, uh, around me because of me or or anything because i i know better fortunately um and not to say that others don't other people have very similar upbringings to me might still do just because we're all trash i'm not <laughs> saying i'm not trash so i just want to lessen the the stink of my trash if that makes sense metaphor excuse the metaphor <laughs> I feel you there. okay <laughs> we can get back to where we're going with yes. that uh social media stuff where can find you? uh so just search for sam turpin instagram it's i am sam turpin that's t-u-r-p-i-n on instagram twitter sam underscore turpin uh our group is called chinese food obviously you spell that how it is and the collective is charles jean suite um so that's charles jean g-e-n-e suite s-u-i-t-e um what else facebook also we're all there and yeah new stuff on the way we're cool. doing yeah it's gonna be dope well as you say you've got tons of music in the bank so we've got years of dope music to look forward to definitely um, also, um, and you're going to be playing more instruments and stuff on your music as time goes Yeah, I've already tracked bass on my stuff already. I'm um, just trying to get better at it. Um, I always always done my own keys and stuff, so I'm just trying to get better at it. And keep my scores as well, because I might want to play stuff live. Yeah, yeah. So I never used to keep my scores or my notes down. And some of the sessions are long gone. I'll never be able to, unless I play it by ear. But um, yeah, trying to keep all that stuff well documented. Sweet. Thank you so much for your time, bro. Cool, no problem.